Michael asked me to cover for him today. So, yes, it is someone other than Michael, and I'll try to do my best, but I'm certain I won't be quite as good as Michael. He does this on a regular basis. I'm Sam Capel, for those who you don't, me, don't know me, and I'll be coming from Explore the Bible. We'll be talking about following God's design. Particularly here, following God's design is talking about following God's design in marriage. Um, in Genesis 2, 21 to 25, it lays it out, I think, pretty clearly. It says, so the Lord caused deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And he said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called a woman for she was taken from man. This is why man leaves his father and mother, bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. Throughout the Bible, we see God's model for Christian marriage and our design for what sex was intended for. We see that um, God created a man and a woman to be together, to be one flesh, and as I've heard said before, God's plan is for us to have abstinence prior to marriage and then enjoy the fruits of marriage. You can catch up after you have made your vows. Needless to say, a lot of things in our society don't actually work that way. There are a lot of problems that come for those people who ignore God's way for their lives. Solomon ran into some of those problems, and I think that that might have been why he wanted to talk to his son in the way that he did. He had a lot of wisdom. What is wisdom? I've been told wisdom was knowledge by experience. I believe that. I've seen people who had knowledge, people I've taught with at the university level who may have had a major in organizational behavior and how to deal with people, and then they were put in a position of administration, and they were the antithesis of everything they had ever taught. They had head knowledge, but they didn't have wisdom. They had taught people to behave in ways that they didn't behave. So I think Solomon had wisdom, and I think he had it through experience. I think we'll see that Solomon had some tough times in his life. Throughout the Bible, we see the illustration of the marriage being the relationship that the church has with Jesus Christ his own bride, and we wait as the bridegroom for the arrival. He waits as the bridegroom for the arrival of the church, who he sees faultless without blemish or spot. That's a wonderful place to be. There's so much wisdom here, and there's so many prices that are paid for people who ignore the wisdom of God. <clears throat> now, Solomon had been through some things, and from his, from the things that he did, he learned a lot. Let's go ahead and look at the scripture for today, which comes from the fifth chapter of Proverbs, and I'm just going to kind of read that through for you. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely. I think it's great when a father instructs his sons. Lots of times fathers don't spend sufficient time instructing their sons. They just put them out there been for themselves. It's been my experience that usually a mother will prepare her daughter more for coming into the world than the father does the son. Listen closely to my understanding so that you may discern in your lips safeguard knowledge. Through the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey and all her words are smoother than oil. In the end she is bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps head straight for Sheol. Sheol was known as the place of the dead in the Old Testament. She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know what, that her ways are unsustainable. So now, sons, listen to me, and don't turn away from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. 
Otherwise, you will give up your vitality to others or your years to someone cruel. Strangers will drain your resources. In your hard-earned pay, you will end up in a foreigner's house. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed, and you will say, how I hated discipline, and how my heart despised correction. I didn't obey my teachers or listen closely to my instructors. I am on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. I think Saul had been, I think Saint, um, Solomon had been here. And he's speaking from experience. He made a number of mistakes, as did his father. But one thing we can take away is God's wonderful grace. As you remember, who was Solomon? Solomon was the product of an illicit relationship between David and Bathsheba. Um, David saw her taking a bath on the rooftop, had her brought to his court, knew her, and then commanded that her husband be brought in. But her husband was so loyal to his men that he refused to go and sleep with his wife. He slept like his men did outside until he returned to the battle. They had him put on the front lines, and there he was killed. At that time, Bathsheba was pregnant, and they were hoping that her husband would think it was his, but since he refused to sleep with her, he ended up paying the ultimate price. So Solomon was brought out of kind of a situation that was not according to God's plan, and he was a Hittite. His father was a Hittite. Well, who were the Hittites? Well, when God sent the Israelites into Canaan, he told them to utterly destroy the people who live there, that they would corrupt them, that they would corrupt their religion. One of the two tribes that they did not destroy was the Hittites. And so, had they done according to what the Lord had commanded, there would have been no Bathsheba. And so, Solomon is a product of that. And so, he had his problems as well. All we can say is, praise the Lord for his grace. We all make mistakes. We all have problems. Yet he loves us and cares for us and gives us opportunities. <clears throat> it goes on to say, enjoy marriage. Drink water from your own cistern. That's pretty straight. Uh, enjoy yourself with your own spouse. Water flowing from your own well. Don't go out and don't go out and commit adultery. Should your springs flow in the street? Streams in the public squares? They should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. In other words, stay loyal. Let your fountain be blessed. Take pleasure in the wife of your youth. As a loving deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. Why, my son, would you lose yourself with a forbidden woman or embrace a wayward woman? For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes, and he considers all his paths. It doesn't matter if others don't find out. Everything we do is before the eyes of the Lord. And if we claim to be his, it certainly seems that after all he's done for us and the sacrifice he gave through the life of his son for our salvation, that we would want to be obedient servants to the king of kings. A wicked man's iniquities will trap him. He will become tangled in the ropes of his own sin. He will die because there is no discipline and be lost because of his great stupidity. I think all of us have seen these types of situations. We've seen situations on both sides where husbands decided to be unfaithful to their wives, where wives have decided to be unfaithful to their husbands. God's plan was not for single parent households. There's an influence that should be there from the father and an influence from the mother in a godly home. There should be the bride and the bridegroom. I think Solomon knew a lot about this. And I think when he was uh, talking about 
sharing the love, your bride, he was talking about his first wife. It's so easy to know what to do and not do what we should do. I do it many times. Sometimes I look at what would have been the right way. How would Jesus have handled this? How did I handle it? Why did I handle it so wrong? But I can't get consumed in that. I just have to go to the Father, ask forgiveness, accept his grace. Grace, grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. No matter what I've done, I can be forgiven. However, you heap problems on yourself when you don't follow the directions of the Creator. It's like going in and trying to assemble something or trying to fix something on your own without consulting the instructions given you by the people who created it. God is our Creator. The Bible is our wonderful instruction book. It's the owner's manual, and he is the owner. And we abide by that. We don't have the problems in life that we could encounter. It might seem fun for a while, but it's not. You see people go out and they decide to go beyond the bounds of marriage, their sexual relationships. I honestly believe it's usually a matter of pride. It's usually a matter of self where they go out, they want to believe that they are desirable to somebody and they run into someone else who also wants to feel like they are desired by someone. Oh, they get together. And as a friend of mine from West Texas used to say, it ends up being no more than friction in fiction. Two people pretending that somebody else really loves them. It doesn't usually end in good. And Certainly, his advice to stay away from the house, guard your steps. In the last lesson, he talks about, guard your steps. Watch where you go. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. And you're so much more likely to have life as you would have it be. And when we go back and look at Solomon and we said, well, how did he get this knowledge through experience? I'll go back to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonian, Hittite women, from the nation which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow other gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines and turned his heart away from the Lord. The Lord who had planted him and told him he would make him the wisest man ever, and since what he asked for was wisdom, the Lord said he would also give him the greatest kingdom and the greatest wealth. The one who gave him everything, put him as a king above earthly kings. Solomon turned his back on him. Why? Because he didn't follow the instruction book. Now in that time, Solomon, if you remember, David was told that he was not to build a temple, that his son would build that, and Solomon did build a temple. And he, God said that David would not build the temple because he was a warrior king. He, his son would be a king of peace. And Solomon was a king of peace. He apparently had a real way with words. He was wise. He could be conciliatory. He could get treaties. The people who had frequently been their enemies. And unfortunately, a lot of times when you formed a treaty in that time, the prince or king who formed the treaty to ensure that the treaty took hold or that you wouldn't get attacked by them or they wouldn't get attacked by you, they bring their daughter and offer her in marriage to the king so that there would be a blood relationship between them and the king and 
They might have grandchildren in common, and so it'd be less likely that they would be attacked by that king or that they would attack that king. It was a pagan practice, but it seems as though Solomon kind of bought into it. Um, to these women, Solomon was deeply attached. 700 wives and 300 who were concubines. And they turned his heart away. You've often heard people say, when mama's happy, everybody's happy. Well, if you had a thousand mamas to keep happy, I'm not sure that anybody would be happy. Amongst his wives, different ones had different gods. Different ones came from different cultures. Different ones had different practices. They all wanted to worship as they pleased. They all enjoyed a life of luxury. They had eunuchs that waited on them hand and foot. But they still wanted, they wanted their freedom. They wanted the right to worship according to their own way. And Solomon had fallen in love with so many of these women. When Solomon was old, he just relented. His wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his day, father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians and Millicom, the aberrant idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father, David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. At that time, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the aberrant idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the aberrant idol of the Ammonites, on the hill directly across from the temple in Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their gods. Solomon got lost. He got started here. He took on many wives. He lost sight of the one who had put him where he ended up. As a result, after this, we found that only one tribe survived. The rest were gone. It's a shame. Israel was torn asunder. But God saved a remnant on behalf of David. God made a promise to David that his line would be the line through whom Jesus came, and so this was the remnant when it was saved. Um, it was the tribe of Judah, from which we get the name Jew for the Jewish people. Uh, the other tribes were annihilated or incorporated into other peoples around the earth. You know, I really don't know if Solomon wrote these Proverbs and these wonderful wise instructions prior to his fall and his attraction to all these women, or if he learned this and looked back over his life as a tragedy and said, I need to share the wisdom that the Lord has given me with these children so that they don't make the same mistakes that I did. I don't know if it was out of penitence or if it was out of wisdom before he turned his attention away from the Lord. What do I take away from this lesson? I take away thankfulness for God's grace. Because the grace is greater than all my sin. I'm not going to be saved by my works, that's for sure. I'm going to be saved through God's grace. When I get to heaven, I'm certain I'll see King David, despite his relationships, his relationship with Bathsheba and having her husband killed. I'm going to seek out Solomon. I'm certain that his wisdom will be nothing compared to the wisdom that we'll experience when we get to heaven and we get to look directly into God's face and we'll know things we've never known before. That verse has always fascinated me. Now I look through the glass darkly, but then face to face, and I cannot imagine what it's going to be like to have things revealed that I could never figure out throughout my entire life.
It gives me hope that we will continue. It helps me to know that God is still there. It makes me so thankful that Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice, his son, so that we might be saved. And it reminds me, if I want to be happy in Jesus, as the song went when I was a child, trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So if I follow the model that he has for Christian marriage and sexual behavior, I'm much more likely to be happy in my life. And those who do go down that path can certainly be a testimony to others about how much, how many problems it's caused in their lives. So many people are in jail for not paying child support or not paying alimony or they have a relationship with somebody and they think it's a real attraction, but it was only a, a self-centered relationship where they were trying to feel needed and wanted and loved and come out of it finding out there's no substance to it and wishing that they had not destroyed the relationship they had with the bride of their youth. I pray for young people these days that they'll read the word, that they'll cling to the word, that we'll teach them the word. I still see families that have been married close to 50 years that are seeking divorces and deciding to go their own way rather than the way Christ laid out for marriage. I pray for them too. Our society is built on marriage. So much of the breakdown I see in our society right now, I see has been a breakdown in marriage and illicit sex and families that are made up of single parents where that one parent doesn't have the time to teach and raise the children. And the children are kind of raised on their own and they go out and they get into trouble and they stir up strife and they don't learn they don't learn the lessons that should be learned in a Christian household. This is a time in our nation when we see the effects of that. We see the problems that come from not serving God. I hope you've taken something away from this Bible lesson. It may have been a little different approach than Michael would have taken. Undoubtedly it was. But if you don't mind, I'd like to close the word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word, to see your plan for our lives, to see the devastating results that occur when we don't follow your plan. Father, I pray for all those who are watching this today, that you'll bless their marriages, that you'll bless their relationships, that you'll reinforce to them the value of following you, not only in the areas of marriage, but in every area in which you give us instructions for living a successful and happy Christian life. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son. I thank you for the grace by, by which I am saved and could not be saved otherwise. Father, I pray that you will speak and whatever distraction I might be in the delivery of this message might be forgotten, but that your message might stand forever within the hearts of those who receive it. Help us all stay close to you and to study your word regularly. Be with our church, I pray. I pray, thank you that you've been with our church during this period with COVID-19. And I thank you, Father, that we still stand as one in Jesus Christ. Be with us. Show us what you would have us to do. Give us a love and a light for our community, I pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thanks.